At the start of his music career, John Lennon's greatest desire was to get on a bit of plastic like the one that's contained in this record jacket. He and the other Beatles loved records. This was the medium of popular music of the 1950s as they were growing up, and of rock music in the 1960s that they and their colleagues were producing. Records were vital for dancing at parties, but by the late 1960s, as the music that records contained got more complex and interesting, they were listened to in solitude or in small groups of friends who would gather to talk about their favorite groups and new releases. Beatle records were constantly broadcast on the radio, the group appeared on television every few months, and on rare occasions, lucky fans could catch them in concert. But by far, records were the easiest and the best way to enjoy the Beatles' music. So we wish to be sure that you have a good basic understanding of the vinyl medium. Records in the U.S. and Britain and most of the world were marketed in various formats that played at different speeds. You had the seven-inch single uh, with one song per side, played at 45 revolutions per minute, 45 RPM, therefore these were typically called 45s. There would be the hit song on the A side and some filler song on the B side. The B side would rarely get played uh, on the radio, the hit side was, of course, what uh, people were looking for uh, when they went to purchase uh, a 45. The Beatles were unusual, though, in having many uh, double A-sided singles. The second format is the 12-inch uh, record, which is the album, because it contains many more than two songs. Uh, this 12-inch album would play at 33 and a third uh, revolutions per minute. Uh, the LP, this particular album, this is a Spanish pressing of A Hard Day's Night entitled Que Noche La De Aquel Dia. And uh, it has seven songs on the A side of the album, which are the seven songs from the film A Hard Day's Night. And then the B side has the other six songs that the Beatles recorded for this album. In between the albums and the singles are uh, the EPs, the extended plays. They typically had two songs uh, per side and would play at either speed, 45 or 33. 10-inch 78s, which were largely phased out through the 1950s, played single songs on each side. This was the medium of the Quarrymen's disc cut in July 1958. And we see here a replica of the one unique copy made at that time. Although 78 RPM records were retired from most markets by the end of the 1950s, Beatle 78s were still manufactured in India and the Philippines through the mid-1960s. Record albums were packaged in sleeves that became more imaginative as the 1960s progressed. They were centered in the early years mostly on providing information and marketing, but uh, there was already a sign with the Beatles' second album of their artistic intent in uh, this black and white photograph taken by Robert Freeman for the second album with the Beatles released in November 1963, a thoughtful and somber look. And uh, the back of the album featured a listing of the tracks on the album and some information on what the listener might expect to hear uh, in each of the songs. By 1967, this was the packaging for a Beatles album, this uh, being Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The front cover, a beautiful, colorful, psychedelic collage. The back cover, another photograph of the, the band, but uh, mostly given over to uh, the presentation of the entire song lyrics for the album. Uh, again, befitting the thoughtful listening that uh, fans were giving the Beatles records now. The inside of this gatefold is a portrait of the uh, band members in their new uh, facial hair and with their Sgt. Pepper uniforms. Singles were normally contained in stock sleeves carrying the record company's trademark, like these from Capitol Records, uh, which was EMI's outlet in the United States uh, that released the Beatles records uh, beginning in December 1963. 
But VJ, uh, the small Chicago company that licensed a few early Beatle records, packaged all of them in one special end-of-year Christmas sleeve in 1964. Each American single on the Capitol label had a special picture sleeve, like this one for I Want to Hold Your Hand, that was printed for its initial run. Such picture covers were made in England only for Strawberry Fields Forever and for Let It Be. The record label itself would carry a lot of information. It would show the artist's name, the song title, the song's composers, the name of the publisher, the timing, how long the song was. It would provide the name of the agency for rights clearance. It provided the catalog number for restocking and the matrix number that would indicate which master tape was used in making the single. And sometimes other information as well. This one, uh, the Canadian release of A Hard Day's Night, indicates that it's from the Beatles' new film. Particular care was taken in selecting the running order of the album tracks. The first song on the album had to be the strongest or have a particularly arresting initial sound, as in the radically different count-offs that announce I Saw Her Standing There on the Please Please Me album and Taxman on Revolver, or the jarring initial chord from 12-string guitar, piano, acoustic guitar in A Hard Day's Night or the rhythmically complex opening of Drive My Car on the Rubber Soul album, or the sound of the landing of the jet in Back in the USSR that opens the White Album. The second side of an album had to close with the next strongest song to leave a favorable impression to make the listener want to turn that record over and start it over again, or to provide an appropriate closer like the lullaby, Good Night. Otherwise, the last song on side one and the opener to side two had similar requirements, and there was an attempt to evenly distribute the different lead singers and emphasize a changing variety of tempos and textures. The sound was in the groove, the path followed by the diamond stylus. The groove contains many hundreds, perhaps a thousand wobbles per inch. Each wobble causes the stylus to vibrate, the faster the vibration, the higher the pitch. The wider the wobble, the louder the sound. Longer recordings required the grooves to be packed more closely together than shorter tracks. A very long song, like the seven-minute Hey Jude, required very careful manufacture, microgrooving the stampers so that the song would fit on a single, but allowing enough space to accommodate loud passages. The stylus could be dropped at the beginning of the side or at any point thereafter. Most albums had rills between songs for easy access to individual tracks. Initial pressings of the White Album did not contain rills, and so it was meant to be enjoyed start to finish, interrupted only by the changes of its four sides, its being the Beatles' one double album. Monophonic records producing just one continuous signal caused the stylus to vibrate side to side. Stereophonic records, reproducing a left and a right channel, caused both side to side and up and down sets of vibrations, resulting in a soundscape that could place any sound along a left to right continuum, and even suggest front to back depth through loudness and degrees of reverb. All of the Beatles singles were released in mono until 1969, at which point they were released in stereo only. The Beatles albums were released in side-by-side -side mono and stereo versions until 1969 when they were also released exclusively in stereo. I'm standing with a collection of 1,300 Beatles singles from 46 countries, representing about a sixth of the world's variety of 7-inch Beatle releases. I'd like to show you a few examples. First up is a January 1962 reissue of the Beatles' first release, My Bonnie, as it appeared in Germany. Note that only Tony Sheridan gets artist credit. Here's the Beatles' first Parlophone uh, record, Love Me Do, as it was released in the UK 
in its so-called uh, beach towel sleeve. On the day after the October 5th, 1962 release of Love Me Do, the Beatles appeared at a record store in Widnes, the town neighboring Liverpool to the southeast, to sign copies of the record for their fans. This is a record store bag autographed by the group that day. The Beatles had fan clubs throughout England and soon the rest of the world. Each year beginning in 1963, they recorded Christmas greetings exclusively for fan club members, pressed on flexible plastic, including silly skits, warped versions of Christmas songs and their own hits, and of course, thanks for buying their records. The Beatles were very popular early on in Sweden. She Loves You was sold with eight different colored picture sleeves. Here are two of them. The first American number one was accompanied by an iconic year-old photo by Dezo Hoffman, used on three American singles in 1964. Here are a couple of those. I'd mentioned that Strawberry Fields Forever, backed with Penny Lane, was the first British single to have a picture sleeve. Here's the front, showing the new-look Beatles with their facial hair and colorful clothing. The back appropriately showed the four Beatles in a scrapbook of their baby snapshots. The Danish picture sleeve for Strawberry Fields Forever incorporated a map of the Penny Lane district, marking the location of the Strawberry Fields Orphanage near where the Beatles grew up. In 1968, the Beatles started their own record label, Apple, the first to use design to differentiate the A side, the hit, from the B side. EP records were not common in the U.S., but VJ sold this one and Capitol uh, two of their own. Parlophone released many EPs in England, including this double EP for the Magical Mystery Tour television show. It was complete with a booklet of uh, stills from the film. And it was also full of song lyrics. Radio stations and other promotional outlets received free demonstration copies that were marked as different from those that were sold through different colored labels, and which sometimes indicated the A side for plugging, either with a big red A, as done in Britain, or with an X, as some companies did in the U.S. British singles would also be affixed with a label sometimes to indicate that they were promotional copies. The American promo disc for Penny Lane featured a different trumpet ending than did the mix on stock copies sold in stores, which is why the record at home did not sound exactly as it did on the radio. Picture discs became popular in the 1970s and thereafter. Beginning in 1983 in the UK, the 20th anniversary of the release of each single was celebrated with a new picture disc. Finally, Singles were not marketed on 7-inch vinyl worldwide. Polish releases were pressed on colorful, flexible postcards suitable for mailing. Before 1967, American albums were very different from their British models. The track listings on the British with the Beatles and the American Meet the Beatles demonstrates. Note the appearance of 14 songs on With the Beatles, but only 11 on Meet the Beatles. The American album contains both sides of the hit single, I Want to Hold Your Hand and I Saw Her Standing There, whereas most British albums did not include singles. Otherwise, note the exclusion of Beatle performances of American R&B songs, Please Mr. Postman, Roll Over Beethoven, You Really Got a Hold on Me, Devil in Her Heart, and Money from the first Capitol album. These would all appear on the Beatles' second album, giving that record a much stronger R&B coloring than this Meet the Beatles. It's commonly thought that the American butchering of British album content might have prompted the photograph of the Beatles in butcher smocks holding decapitated baby dolls and slabs of meat, but this was actually a statement about American violence suggested by the photographer. Distributed as the cover for Yesterday and Today, the photo offended many and was quickly withdrawn. Initial copies of the album cover were destroyed or pasted over with a second innocuous slick, what's called the trunk cover. 
This is such a second state, pasted over butcher cover. The two big clues as to what lies underneath are Ringo's V-shaped smock collar, which shows through the pasted over trunk slick, and the spine edge, which reveals the slick underneath. Upon discovering this treasure, many fans steamed the trunk slicks off their butcher covers with varied results. Another highly sought after item is the initial run of the British mono release of Revolver. It was recalled just days after release because John Lennon changed his mind about which mix of the Tomorrow Never Knows he preferred. This rare first pressing can be identified at sight by the different matrix number stamped into the dead wax at the end of side two. The British release of Let It Be was accompanied by this book it's full of uh, stills and dialogue from the film, as it was provisionally titled, Get Back. Finally, we should represent the large number of bootleg recordings of Beatles stage shows and broadcasts that saw illegitimate, unauthorized release, beginning in 1969 with items like this, Yellow Matter Custard. This particular album is full of BBC performances by the Beatles in mid-1963. So if this introduction does not make a vinyl collector out of you, you will at least understand how the Beatles' followers listened to their music when it was new and have continued their involvement with it ever since.